Starting off our list at number 10, the first peace treaty. Unusual at the time? Absolutely. The first peace treaty in history was back in 1271 BC. At this point in history, Egyptians and the Hittite Empire were fighting over modern day Syria. This conflict had been lasting centuries and come 1274 BC, the Battle of Kadesh was finally underway. Tons of bloodshed, no clear victor in sight. What's left to do now at this point? Ramses II and King Hattusili III both negotiated a peace treaty where both sides would aid each other if a third party decided to get involved. A copy of the treaty can be found right now in New York above the entrance to the United Nations Security Council chamber. It's also in the Guinness Book of World Records as the oldest peace treaty ever. That's how you know it's official. Our man Guinness confirms it. Boom, that's how you know, moving on. Number nine, game night. I love board games, and honestly, that includes Monopoly. I have the patience for it every now and then, you know? Pass and go, I'm like, okay, I'll pay the tax. I'm respecting this game so far. But ancient Egyptians, turns out they also loved board games. Dogs and Jackals, Mehen, Senate, and 20 Squares, those are some popular games. Mehen was played during the pre-dynastic period, around 2500 BC, and the goal here was to reach the center of the spiral. The board was a coiled snake almost. Senate was the most popular game. Kings and queens alike would play this one. Senate had a long board with 30 squares painted on it. Of course, the rules are still unknown, heavily debated, just like Monopoly today. I'm like, is it 200 or 100, are we sure? But now we have some ideas how Egyptians played Senate. There were three rows of 10 squares, the last five were always decorated. Now it's assumed this game was themed on the afterlife. Plus King Tut was buried with one of these boards, so that's definitely something to do with it. And there's also some paintings of Queen Nefertiti playing Senate, so you know it was addictive. It looks a lot like chess. Imagine playing a pharaoh in chess. My palms are already so sweaty. Number eight, glamour. Makeup in ancient Egyptian culture was key. Not only did they wear makeup and smell good because they wanted to resemble the very gods they believed in, but makeup had a practical use as well in the daily life of a pharaoh. They believed makeup gave you protection from the gods Ra and Horus. They would put together these beauty kits by grinding down malachite and galena, and then they would create the substance called coal. There wasn't a lot of blending back then. Makeup was often applied directly to the skin using wood or bone. And it wasn't just the ladies as well. Men wore makeup and perfume. Of course, you gotta look good and smell good. Be like, have you seen them? What? I, I wanna wear some of this. They smell like beautifulness. They smell like the afterlife. They smell amazing. Egyptians believed makeup had healing abilities, and honestly, they weren't wrong. Makeup back then had enough lead in them, so eye infections would stay away, ideally. Number seven, dozer. For this one, we're looking into some bull worshiping, so grab your red scarves and start waving them around. Just north of the Steppe Pyramid of the Pharaoh Doser, archeologist August Marionette discovered this site in 1851. The Serapium is a temple dedicated to the Egyptian deity Serapis, a combination of Osiris and Apis in human form. Now this was a large burial ground for the Apis bulls. They were basically these bulls that were said to be sacred and after their death, they would become immortal. Remember that, that's important. Today at Saqqara, there's this massive vault. It's 382 yards long, and it's carved out of sandstone bedrock. It's massive, and along the sides of them are 24 chambers, each with sarcophagus carved out of a single chunk of granite. Now inside these boxes were animal remains, just bones and all. But back then, in those times, you weren't allowed to break up any bodies. That was a no-go. You had to mummify them. So how are these tombs built, first of all, so perfectly, weighing over 80 tons, and where do these bones come from? Perhaps these are the remains of the Apis bull. After all, that's the inspiration for the Minotaurs, so maybe alien ancestors looked a lot more jacked than we may think. Number six, King Tut. One of the greatest mysteries is of course the history of the young King Tut. The young boy became pharaoh at just age nine in 1332 BC, but during his time of ruling, the young king had to face a country in conflict. Egypt and Nubia were going head to head over land, and not even 10 years into ruling, the young pharaoh died at age 18. It wasn't until 1922 until he was seen again. Howard Carter discovered the tomb of the lost king, appropriately in the Valley of the Kings. This is where we could have been more careful here in history. Sure, it's exciting finding mummies and discovering your history and all that jazz, but when King Tut was discovered, they tried to move his body out of the oil that coated the coffin. But in doing so, they damaged him. So now it's next to impossible to tell what really took his life at such an early age. We have some ideas though, it's not entirely hopeless. It's believed right now that King Tut had a broken leg. After some 3D scans were done, it appears the king wasn't in the best shape prior. He may have fallen off of a chariot. So if Tut passed away at an early age, out of nowhere, this could mean another mystery is afoot. Number five, original plans. Another theory that surrounds the queen is that King Tut's chamber 
was actually meant for her. Yeah, listen to this. The former antiquities minister doesn't believe this. He strongly stands by his belief that the lost queen was one of the female mummies found in the Valley of the Kings. What's compelling here though is that King Tut passed away at age 19. So many believe his own burial chamber hadn't even been built yet, or finished at least. So instead, they used hers. But a radar survey around the tomb in the Valley of the Kings shows us this hidden chamber behind the north wall of the burial chamber. It's been said before that King Tut's chamber was way too small and there must be more. His stepmom being buried in the same tomb, well, that's certainly a start. We're on to something. Number four, a fake beard. Not really unusual considering the times, but this is definitely worth a mention. Long before Cleopatra, Hatshepsut was the first woman to obtain power as a pharaoh. She was the sixth pharaoh of the 18th dynasty and there were only just a few that were women in total. But during her reign back in the mid 1400s BC, following the death of Thutmose II, she was determined on being portrayed as a male. This was her goal, this was her vision. The pharaoh fake beard, massive muscles. Historians believe this was done as an act of politics. It was done on purpose to make a point. After her passing, come 1458 BC, her stepson then took the throne, Thutmose III. And then he destroyed everything in her name and image. Well, mostly everything. Number three. Khufu. In order to become a god in the afterlife, these kings would build massive temples or pyramids. The Giza pyramids were built over 4,500 years ago, and to this day, they draw in about 15 million visitors a year. Pharaoh Khufu's is the largest pyramid in Giza, and it was the first pyramid that they started to build, obviously taking the longest. Reaching up to 147 meters high, it took 2.3 million rocks to create this landmark, and its alignment with Orion's belt gives it an extraterrestrial vibe, and with Tesla CEO Elon Musk tweeting Reading aliens built the pyramids, obvi, we now have to ask just how did thousands of workers achieve this? The placement of the pyramid is also unique as well. It's aligned perfectly with the cardinal directions, north, south, east, and west. That much accuracy back then with the stars and the earth and the heavens, they must have gotten help from alien friends or else they had the world's biggest protractor. Number two, hippo problems. Do you have any idea how fast hippos are in real life? I had no clue my entire life. They're really fast, they fly at you, they're like dinosaurs. Hippos can run as fast as 50 kilometers an hour. Yeah, I'll just lead with that. Pharaoh Menes was Egypt's first pharaoh ever, so it felt fitting to include some pet problems in our list. We don't know much about the lost pharaoh because, well, for starters, he was alive a very long time ago, 3000 BC, that's where we're talking. But what we do know for certain is that King Menes ruled over Egypt during a peaceful time, and he was stomped to death by a hippo. It's literally how his history.com says it, in that order. This king spent over 60 years on the throne, and a hippo got him. I don't think there's a harder way to go out, honestly, in my opinion. It's a mystery still, thousands of years later, but Look at zoos today, I don't know. Maybe a hippo didn't like living like a king. Maybe he wanted to live like Shrek and just splash around and be dirty. He's an animal, he's literally a hippo, you know? And finally coming in at number one, a renewed passport. I'll be honest, right now I currently have no idea where my passport is. Chris, do you know where yours is? Uh, yeah. Wow, we have an adult here, wow, an adult, that's lovely. I always panic and search for it 13 hours before a flight. I am the worst to travel with. Passports are important, obviously, and they're a pain in the ass to replace. But did you know you can still get one even if you've been dead for, I don't know, thousands of years? There's a fun fact. Pharaoh Ramses II, one of ancient Egypt's greatest rulers, got a passport back in 1974. Yeah, you heard me. After being exhumed and put on display for so long, it was decided it's time to send the lost king off to Paris to get, you know, a little touched up, being dead that long and all. Now obviously you're not gonna list this pharaoh as luggage, that's so rude. So the Egyptian government gave Ramses II his own official Egyptian passport for his commute. On the passport he had his age, his occupation, king, obviously, and in case it wasn't clear, it was stated that the king too was deceased. Anyone who's seen The Mummy can obviously, you know, relax at that point. Number 10, history. Ruling alongside the pharaoh Akhenaten from 1353 to 1336 BC, Queen Nefertiti, aka the Lady of Grace, aka Hereditary Princess, was born in 1370 BCE. She was born in the Egyptian city of Thebes, and she was only 15 years old when she married the 16-year-old Akhenaten. She worshipped the sun god Aten, and alongside her young husband, she built a new capital city called Armana, and she also created a new religion, so how's that? She ruled over what's considered the wealthy wealthiest period in Egypt history. Nefertiti had six children, which were all daughters, which may have had something to do with why we don't know much about her today, but I'll get into that much later on. Number nine, her death. After changing Egypt's religious and political structure, soaring to new heights as a woman in the Egyptian court, the queen 
just vanished, just like that. And on this video, we're gonna try and figure out what may have happened to her. During the 12th year of the 17 that her husband ruled for, historical records seem to have just wiped out the queen's legacy. She was gone from everything. Many believe that she didn't actually die, but rather she disguised herself and continued to rule. The next in line after Akhenaten's reign was the pharaoh Smenker. Was that really Nefertiti in disguise? I hope so. That would be pretty sweet if we proved that and figured that out. I'm really rooting for that. The reason we believe that she may have disguised herself as a man is because of the female pharaoh, Hapshephut, because they ruled with a fake beard in the 15th century. It's known that they had a big traditional fake beard. It's cool. It's like kind of flashy. I kind of want one. I can't grow a beard or a mustache, so I kind of want to fake one myself. Lastly, there's a theory that the reason Nefertiti was banished was because she couldn't produce a male hair. We've gotten closer to uncovering the truth though recently in 2015, when Nicholas Reeves and Mamdou El Damadi found what they think is a hidden doorway in King Tut's tomb that contains perhaps the sarcophagus of the lost queen. I'll get into that shortly, but first we need to talk about her modern day origins. Number eight. Berlin bust. Perhaps one of the most popular ancient sculptures of all time was found on December 6, 1913. German archaeologist Ludwig Borchardt found this on the floor of the Royal Sculptures Workshop. This figure has some unforgettable details. I mean, first of all, she's breathtaking to look at, and the blue headpiece. These are all important. It was clear that this was Queen Nefertiti from the start. The German team split everything with the Egyptian government, so currently, this bust is being held in Berlin. It draws in about 50,000 visitors a year to Berlin's newest museum a little piece of Egypt all the way over there. We love it. Now, fun little fact about this modern bust. In 2009, there were scans done to it. Technology, nice. And it's revealed that underneath this painted layer is limestone carving of a woman so detailed that you can see wrinkles in her cheeks, even a bump on her nose as well. That's very, that's like 4K Egypt. It's crazy. Back in 2016, these two artists secretly 3D scanned the bust of the Lost Queen and then straight up released the files online as a free download. The future is here, I guess. Also, that's a little invasive. Just scanning your head, like that's really? But three years later, officials decided to release that to the public, so here it is, take a look. The Queen Nefertiti, 3D bust. Scanned by James Bond secretly. Number seven, Cleopatra's methods. Male rulers took the name Ptolemy and queens were Cleopatra. Her lineage runs deep in the heart of Egypt, but Cleopatra, fun fact, she was not actually Egyptian. She was the last Greek ruler of Egypt, and after Alexander the Great's death in 323 BCE, Ptolemy then took over Egypt, which in turn launched this new wave, this dynasty of Greek rulers that lasted centuries. As Cleopatra got older, she was determined to learn Egyptian. And due to political structure, she started to style herself as the goddess Isis. And then in comes Julius Caesar. Julius Caesar had a history of his own, obviously, and his, rather than family and power, was filled more with, you know, lust, more than anything. He was known to sleep around and then use their power after doing the dirty. When these two crossed paths, history was never the same. In October of 50 BCE, Cleopatra had fled to Syria. Once there, she established an army and returned two years later to face her brother. Cleopatra knew that during this time, she needed all the support she could get, specifically now from the Romans. At the same time, Caesar was looking to collect debts from Cleopatra's father, so they both relied on each other in some way. It was a match made in heaven. Your most compatible has been updated. Right swipe. I would right swipe on Alexander the Great, for sure. I'd be like, who's this handsome man? Mm. Nicknamed Bald Adulterer. Okay, you know, he's trouble. Number six, Hidden Chamber. Ancient Egyptian architecture is mind-blowing. Even to this day, we're trying to figure out how exactly everything was built. More and more secrets are coming out of all these hidden tombs. It's fascinating. Technology is for sure a helping hand when it comes to learning about our past queens and kings. And for Queen Nefertiti, her final resting place is now believed to be in a secret chamber in King Tut's tomb. This was years ago. Egypt tourist minister Hisham Zazu said the discovery was like a big bang. And I see no lies. It's perhaps one of the biggest discoveries of the 21st century. After radar tests were conducted, Conducted, Egyptian officials were 90% sure they found a hidden chamber. And it was also full of treasures, so that's neat. And also, we're onto something. Number five, Lord Nefertiru. For this next piece of evidence, we'll be directing our focus to the land down under. Australian aliens, baby, let's do it. In the Brisbane Water National Park, to be specific. Egyptian hieroglyphs educate us on our past. There's still so much we don't know, but it's fun to find UFO looking objects within them. It's fun to speculate as we are right now. But when Egyptian texts appear around the world in the middle of nowhere, those UFO hieroglyphs get a bit more concerning. Like the Gosford glyphs, for example. Discovered in the 1970s at Kariang, there's around 300 engravings spread over two centuries. 
sandstone walls. The hieroglyphs are strikingly similar to that of Egypt. There's birds, even the markings of a scarab, which are those Milky Way poop pushers that I just talked about earlier. Egyptologist Raymond Johnson believes that this is the burial site of Egyptian royal family member Lord Nefertiru, who met his fate around 2600 BC, with some panels telling the story of two prince brothers who came from Egypt and subsequently became shipwrecked. But other panels get into the extraterrestrial goodness. Some of these Gosford glyphs have UFO shapes, with scarabs, birds, and sun symbols popping up as well. Maybe we did have alien aid when it came to laying these royal family members to rest. Number four, tomb alignment. Nobody knows angles like ancient Egyptians. The way they built the pyramids, I mean, they still stand today confidently. We're trying to figure out just how they made the pyramids in the first place. Meanwhile, there's a team inside the pyramids trying to figure out who is even buried in the walls. It's a whole fascinating mystery. Using ground penetrating radar, researchers were able to find this corridor, this log opening in the bedrock at the exact same depth of King Tut's chamber. And on top of that, these openings are facing the same direction. Tomb KV-62 and this new chamber have the same orientation, so of course we're going to believe that they're connected. Because unconnected tombs don't often align, or don't ever align really, so that's also a sign. We're getting close. Let's just give me a shovel. I'll get in there. I'll help out. Be so gentle with everything. I'll feather things off. I've seen national treasure. Number three, no more religion. This was a huge deal in ancient Egypt, rightfully so. The pharaoh Akhenaten thought it would be a great idea to just end multiple religious beliefs. Yep, yeah, just uh, stop. Okay, now we just do the one. Traditional Egyptian culture would believe in multiple gods, but this pharaoh couldn't keep up, so he convinced everybody to believe in just one god, Aten. Well, only days after his passing, the people of Egypt said, screw that, we're gonna go back to multiple beliefs. That was working a lot better for us, thank you, sir. And then also we're destroying every piece of evidence that involves you for trying that nonsense. Yeah, temples, cooking pots, anything with his image, gone and ideally forgotten. It wasn't until the 19th century when we realized this pharaoh once ruled. Number two, her family. The queen's name translates to a beautiful woman has come. And given the fact that we still don't know her parentage, we have to use our national treasure brains here. A beautiful woman has come. Come from where? Well, early Egyptologists believed that Queen Nefertiti came from Syria. Back then, it was Mitanni. Her family roots are still debatable, but there's reason to believe that Nefertiti was actually Egyptian born. In fact, many believe she's related to King Akhenaten. We don't really know. The lost queen did have children of her own. She had six daughters, like I mentioned before, two of which became queens of Egypt. She may have also been the daughter of A, who at the time was an advisor for the king and ended up becoming pharaoh after King Tut's death in 1323. So we have no idea, but we're getting so close. I feel like we're like years away from finding everything we need to know, but also, this last point is pretty interesting. Number one, sun god origins. Okay, one of the most interesting facts about all of this was the religious impact that the queen made on ancient Egypt. Both her and King Akhenaten were in a cult. How fascinating is that? They were in the cult of the sun god Aten. In the earliest accounts of the queen, she assisted her husband in a ritual that smited the female enemies of Egypt at the time. There have been a few blocks that have since been recovered from the Theban tombs of the royal butler that depicts the queen wearing her unique blue crown, so definitely her, part of these sun god rituals. So cut to the end of the king's ruling, the Aten was now Egypt's main god. She made a new god. She convinced everyone to believe in a new god. That's incredible. We can't even decide on who's gonna win America's Got Talent. She's like trading in traditions and religions. That's wild. Kicking off the list at number 10, KV-55. Located in the Valley of the Kings in Egypt, Tomb 55, otherwise known as KV-55, was found by Edward Arden back in 1907. It was discovered right next to King Tut's tomb, and the reason we call this tomb by a number rather than name is because we really don't know who was inside it yet. Even the walls outside of the tomb, they aren't covered with any hieroglyphs to tip us off or give us any hints. It's just bare which is kind of eerie. As you walk down the 20 steps towards KV-55, you'll notice markings on the entrance, markings that show that the entrance was widened since it was first cut, along with its ceilings being raised higher. So whatever was in there needed the room. The only hint as to who was buried remains on the walls. One hieroglyph remains and it was discovered in 1907 and it translates to the evil one that shall not live again. Even these massive stones were built in order to prevent anything from getting out. See, usually with these ancient tombs, it's the opposite. The description for who's inside the tomb had also been destroyed. So we have no idea who or what is in KV-55. Number nine, King Teti. The Pyramid of Teti was built for the first ruler of the 6th dynasty, and while it's not flashy or massive as these other pyramids, the insides contain the oldest writing in the religious world. Pretty insane. Now these texts go back to 2400 BC, way back when we used, you know, BBM. 
The pyramid texts were specifically written so that this King Teddy could ascend to the heavens after his death. There are spells and incantations meant to free the king's soul and arrive in the cosmos. But more specifically, for Teddy to become a star in the sky and then join Osiris and Orion in the God Squad. There's even instructions on how to preserve the body and travel to said heavens. World's oldest instruction manual for the win. Number eight, Queen Nefertiti. After a scan was done on King Tut's tomb, there were cracks found on the north and earth walls. East, Taylor, east, not earth. There were cracks found on the north and east side walls. So we believe that this is a secret passageway to Queen Nefertiti, the ruler during the 14th century BC, and also wife to King Tut. Queen Nefertiti's parents are also still unknown to this day, so that adds to it. And with ancient texts depicting that these kings and queens would leave Earth and then later return, perhaps they are both descendants of extraterrestrials. And this flying sun disk that they worshipped was not the sun, but rather a winged alien ancestor. Number seven, Monuments Men. It wasn't always a smooth ride for this specific bust. Sometimes it was a bust. I had to, I had to, why not? She spent 11 years in the private residence of Germany's expedition founder, Jacques Simon. Cut to nine years later, that's when King Tut's tomb was discovered. A totally separate event, unbeknownst to them, connected. Howard Carter found King Tut's tomb in 1922, and of course afterwards, the entire world was watching. Just a year later, her bust was finally moved to Berlin. It had a rocky go. It remained in Germans' hands throughout the entire war. Even that big ugly dude with a little mustache said that he himself would never relinquish the head of the queen. So thanks, Spittler. I can't say his name because YouTube. It was hidden in a salt mine throughout the entire Cold War. The Germans would arrive too late though sometimes when stealing rich pieces of art. Like in 1940, for example, they arrived at the Louvre and it was bare. The Mona Lisa was now in a child's bedroom. Curators had moved the pieces, thankfully. But when a bust of a long lost queen of Egypt was being held in a salt mine in the town of Merkers, the monuments men literally saved history. When Sergeant Kenneth C. Lindsay led his team down the 35 miles of tunnel, and aside from the queen's bust, billions of dollars of gold was also found down there, all stolen from the Germans. Number six, dung beetles. This one isn't exactly a pharaoh at all, but it's too good to leave out, especially if we're talking about aliens here. It's important. Dung beetles, also known as scarabs, are the only species in the entire world that follows the Milky Way. Think about that for a second. That is, let's talk about it. Some animals follow the sun. You know, turtles sprint to the ocean the second they're born to avoid getting plucked up by birds. Now these insects would follow the line of the Milky Way and then roll their towards it. Literally, they're, they're poop. They would roll it towards the skies, which is insane. Symbols of these beetles are seen all over, either in hieroglyphics or even in movies, their presence is known. Near the sacred lake at the Temple of Karnak, there's a massive scarab monument. And there's even a legend still to this day behind said statue that if you walk around it nine times, you would find health, wealth, and love. And you'd also probably be a little bit dizzy. The scarab is there to represent the god Kefri, which at the time Egyptians believed was the sun as well. Also known as a scarab face god, which terrifying when you imagine that. Are these bugs just trying to get home into space to their bug alien master? Why does he need so much poop? Whatever DIY project they're working on in the Milky Way probably doesn't smell too good. Number five, Queen Nefertiti's resting place. So yes, on one hand, 3D scanning technology is vital when it comes to these ancient sites. We're able to figure out King Tut's medical issues from thousands of years ago. It's impressive, it's great. But thanks to this new technology, we're also finding hidden chambers in these tombs as well. Another theory surrounding the queen, the lost queen, Nefertiti, is that King Tut's chamber was actually meant for her. The former antiquities minister doesn't believe this at all. He strongly stands by his belief that the lost queen was one of the female mummies found in the Valley of the Kings. But, but King Tut passed away at age 19, so many believed that his own burial chamber at that point wasn't even built yet. So instead, they had to use hers, they had to improvise. A radar survey conducted around the tomb in the Valley of the Kings shows us a possible hidden chamber right behind the north wall of the burial chamber. We still haven't found her final resting place, but perhaps this recent 2021 discovery of an ancient city will hold us off until then. Look at this, we missed this on the news. Where was all this? Crazy. Number four, Userkaf. Remember earlier when I was talking about those extremely heavy granite coffins? Well, the Sun Temple in Egypt may give us more alien clues as to their purpose. Discovered in 1842, this was the base of a giant monument that apparently used to stand over 150 feet tall. Built by the pharaoh Yuzakaf, founder of the 5th dynasty of Egypt, the temple translates to stronghold of Ra. 
Ra being the sun god. This temple at Abu Ghraib was home to one of the world's largest monoliths, and its purpose may blow your mind. This obelisk was built out of granite. Now they made things out of granite back then because it contained quartz. Quartz, due to piezoelectricity, was able to convert the Earth's vibrations into energy. Nikola Tesla did something similar. He figured out standing waves, which was the ability to pass energy through the air. Perhaps these granite monoliths were used to teleport people or goods. That would explain the last point about those Australian glyphs. To be fair, I have zero idea how Bluetooth works either. Alien airdropped in Egypt. I'm here for this theory. Number three, brief ruling. The queen was the stepmother of King Tut. Her daughter was married to King Tut. So there's a handful of Egyptologists that believe that right before King Tut's ruling in the 14th century, there was this really small window where Nefertiti ruled as Pharaoh. There's also a great deal of historians that believe Nefertiti was no ruler to her husband, King Akhenaten, but we don't have enough evidence quite yet to really know what happened. Hence why we're doing a mystery video on the long lost queen. Now we get it. The reason we're adamant on finding everything we can is because she literally changed Egyptian religion. Number two, King Tut. Cut. Only a few years after King Tut's tomb was discovered in the Valley of the Kings, archaeologist Howard Carter found two daggers that were buried with said king. It's not uncommon to be buried with your goods. It's why Egyptians would build these tombs in a certain way, so that grave robbers wouldn't snoop around and steal your entire family heritage. It was made so nothing could get out, which is insane. But two daggers were found with King Tut, one made of iron and the other gold. Now with iron being even more rare than gold in the Bronze Age, this was a big deal. And with recent advancements in technology, we were able to use a technique called portable X-ray fluorescence spectrometry. And according to the journal Meteorites in the Planetary Science, the blade is actually made of iron, nickel, and cobalt, suggesting that this material is of extraterrestrial origin. And finally, number one, the Great Pyramid of Cholula. There are many parallels between Egyptian and Maya civilizations. The two cultures are so far apart, both in time and distance, and they also never made contact. But both pyramids are made with steps and both have stone serpents. The vault arches are also strikingly similar and hieroglyphs within share a lot of the same symbolism. These hieroglyphs include advanced mathematics that they say was bestowed upon them also from these sky gods. Was this just one landing site of our alien ancestors? Let us know in the comments below all your thoughts. Yeah.